Hello, everyone. I hope you've had a great Google Next so far, and thank you so much for attending this session. My name is Malika Golkaram. I am a media specialist customer engineer from Google Cloud, and today I have the pleasure to co-present this session with two industry experts, Jeff Babb, a principal solution uh, design um, architecture from um, Sky, and Moore McCauley. Um, he's a director of product um, from Harmonic. Okay, so what are we hearing in this session? Um, well, I think it's useful for all of us to go a little bit back and look at what's happened in the industry, um, how things have shifted and changed until we've got to this point and go to 2018 and 2019 and see what Google Cloud has done for media customers um, to help them achieve their targets and um, implement their interesting projects. Um, and then I'll ask Jeff uh, to come off the stage and take us to their interesting journey of designing and deploying a future-proof sports streaming platform. Um, and then uh, Maury is going to give us a different angle of how they implemented their um, basically stream processing applications on top of containers to help Sky um, in, in this wonderful project. So this is really interesting for all of us. Today we're all so used to get any sort of content with great quality on any device in a, in a way that we all forget that this industry is actually not that old. If you look at 2005, when for the first time YouTube was launched as basically the biggest streaming platform in the world, um, 10 years down the line, things shifted and changed in every different way. Um, streaming protocols, transcoding formats, um, infrastructure grew, uh, big data, everything changed so rapidly that 10 years down the line, we see uh, a 4% a fall from the traditional TV viewership and that figure lent itself into a 74% increase um, in content viewership on YouTube. So this figure looks a little bit odd because 4% versus 74%, part of it is because the overall viewership of content on traditional TV was a huge number. So when you lent it into YouTube, it becomes a really big factor. Um, but the other part was that people overall started to watch content a lot more than they used to do before because obviously, you could find any sort of niche content you wouldn't be able to find on TV on YouTube. Three years later, this is interesting, the, the overall viewership of content on streaming platforms, um, not only YouTube, but everywhere, uh, witnessed a 35% increase year on year. And then today, where we're standing, people are consuming one billion hours of content only on YouTube. That's a massive number. So that makes us hopeful that for the next five years, um, the, the profit that gets shifted away from traditional you know, TV platforms, IPTV, cable TV, and this 30 billion profit will be uh, spent on online TV platforms. So that will take us to 2025, where half of the viewers of um, the age of below 32 will never actually see a subscription on traditional TV platforms. And that will take the consumption of media on an internet to 25% of the world data. All right, so we know that things have changed so much. We're really proud to be standing in this moment. But we want to see if cloud is going to be the next big wave of um, disruption in, into the media and tech industry at the same time. So let's see why cloud matters in this industry. So problem number one of every technology company um, is the speed to delivery. If you're a media company, your problem is a lot bigger. Why? You're Acquiring a lot of content from studios, from sports organizations, that's massive amount of money you're spending. And you want to make sure that you're launching the service right on time. You are actually providing any sort of necessary infrastructure without having to worry about infrastructure planning. And the other problem about media industry is that it's not only about applications, it's also about the delivery of media across the world. So you need to make sure that your content gets encoded, transcoded, is being sent across the world with minimum delay. The 
other problem is that when you work in a really fast environment, you need to be sure that you're scaling, but you're not constantly calculating and you're not uh, being stingy with your infrastructure because you want to make sure your users are not um, uh, kind of getting delays or that you wouldn't lose your um, uh, viewers to your competition. That's the, a very good example of that is news content. So if you lose um, one or two minutes of uh, content viewership on a uh, content delivery on your network, then people would just go to your competition and then you're using millions of dollars of ads for uh, something pretty plain and simple. Um, so with cloud, you can actually do this scalability pretty fast and then you just shut down your instances and um, after that, you don't really have to worry about a bunch of annoying servers in your infrastructure. Um, then again, you can have any sort of analytics you want. You can think about what you want to do with it later. You can be super generous with your, with your data. And you can also use that data later once you figure out what data set is important for you um, to have intelligent decision making with machine learning. And machine learning is um, infrastructure demanding. So with cloud, you can actually fix that problem. And then the sweet story of studio requirements. So if you're a content, producer, a content distributor and you work with multiple different studios, each of them comes to you with a massive contract of different requirements for your infrastructure. And if you work with a cloud provider, you really don't have to worry about at least the basics of, of these uh, requirements. With all said and done, we still think hybrid solutions are going to stay with media industry for a while from now because you have your transcoders and coders on premise and you want to make sure that um, you are keeping this infrastructure but bursts into cloud whenever it's needed. And here we are. Uh, we are in Google Cloud infrastructure. When you look at that map, you really shouldn't see a lot of like colorful dots and fibers, even though it's entertaining to look at it that way too. Um, but you should actually look at this as a representation of six Google services that have more than one billion subscribers. All these services are sending traffic securely uh, with a lot of scalability through this network, through these points of presence, and cloud is using the very much the same infrastructure that YouTube, um, Gmail, Maps, and those services are, are using. Over the past three years, we have spent $20 billion on infrastructure to maintain and expand our network. We have invested on 13 subsea cables. Um, we've launched in 18 different regions, uh, 55 zones, 134 network edges, and 90 CDN locations plus 73 um, interconnect locations. We recently launched in um, Switzerland, and uh, we are launching in Indonesia and in Japan for the second time. But we know success doesn't come from wealth. What made Google Google is technology. So if you look at different layers of technology here, you see uh, we build our own chips, we build our own uh, hardware, we build our own data centers, we maintain it. Uh, we invented uh, Kubernetes. Uh, all of our services across the board um, use Kubernetes to scale fast and, and easily. Uh, we have multiple layers of identity to control access to our platform. Uh, if you look at how much content is being stored and uploaded in YouTube, um, you will see uh, storage is, none of, uh, is, is not an issue that we would uh, worry about and, and the security around it either. Uh, we talked about our backbone, but it's sitting on top of everything else. And the operational and security of devices is, is something that our SREs are um, paying attention to every day. Okay, so how would your service look like ultimately? Um, if you're a visual um, uh, kind of visual studio company and you have uh, people sitting in Los Angeles, in London, different parts of the world, you have content stored in multiple locations, uh, you want to make sure that you can do your editing on the device uh, that is not present in your data center but gives you the illusion of uh, having it at your vicinity. If you are a live sports company like Jeff is, um, you basically want to make sure that your content is being distributed around the world without any delay. If you are um, a telco and you've acquired other telcos and you're distributing to multiple locations, you want to make sure that your studio rights are uh, being, uh, being uh, obeyed, basically. Um, and finally, 
when you look at the amount of storage you will be needing, you really don't want to worry about how much content is being stored every day. So with Google Cloud, we're giving you huge amount of infrastructure to scale your services. Uh, we give you containers, Kubernetes, app deployment services, where you can deploy with a lot of scalability and reach your goals. Um, we give you a, uh, an 11.9 durable storage, different classes, but instant access across the board um, to, to store your content. Um, your network is basically a global network that is well connected with our fiber, and um, your services are going to be distributed in different virtual private networks, but because they're within Google infrastructure, um, the security is complied and the content is being uh, encrypted at rest and tra at transit. We also give you a lot of big data and machine learning capabilities to sit on top of your services to give you intelligent ideas about how you can push for um, better um, business decisions and for um, maintaining your customers on your platform. This picture always cracks me up. Um, in 2010, this picture went online and uh, it drove the whole internet crazy about whether it was Tom Hanks or Bill Murray. Um, yeah, what do you think? <laughs> so, thank you. Yes, it's Bill Murray. Um, th the whole point is, um, with the whole hype about cloud these days, there's so much similarity between cloud platforms that um, people sometimes get confused about what would be the best decision um, for, for their uh, own uh, business idea. And um, we, we think there are certain things in Google Cloud that shines among all other services. Um, we are investing a lot on hybrid approaches. Um, cloud storage is a, a very special service, especially when it comes to media. We give you metadata caching, redundancy, duplication across the board. It's multi-regional, and regardless of what class of storage you put your content on, um, it's always instant access accessibility. Our CDN is very easy to configure, so it's literally just putting a tick in a box and then content gets cached everywhere. Um, we have a new approach to machine learning. Um, we use AutoML, which gives you access to our models, um, but you can train it with your own data, so you can get rid of a lot of um, you know, unnecessary labels that you would get from a, from a generic model. And the network that we talked about several times, it helps you distribute your content a lot faster. 2018, it was interesting for us. We launched in eight new regions, uh, and we took dedicated and um, partner interconnect to general availability. Uh, with rendering, we rewrote the whole Zing platform, and it's available on um, Google infrastructure and provides up to 48,000 cores to, to editors, an individual editor. Uh, we released a uh, live uh, machine learning um, service for video analysis in real time. We released a lot of features for metadata enrichment and also for monetization like video auto ML, object tracking, and stuff like that. In terms of OTT, Ambato, which is our end-to-end -end platform, launched in Europe. And our CDN, in terms of media, went on GA, and uh, Cloud Armor was launched to protect your service. And we are doing a lot of interesting stuff with archiving. Um, so tape digitization as a part of bigger Google services uh, and art and culture helps our customers that have valuable content to digitize those tapes with very little money and then use machine learning to enrich the metadata for those assets. And what's coming in 2019? We are launching five new C cables across the board. Um, hybrid platforms are going to stay as our highest priority this year, so that will help you work with your streaming services, your um, different types of, if you have machine learning stuff on premise, and a lot of different aspects of hybrid workflows or in different uh, cloud providers with one control plane and the same set of APIs that are basically industry standards like, like Kubernetes, for example. Um, we are replacing our MPAA licensing with TPN, which covers a lot more um, broadcasters and content owners. Um, that will be available on major GCP infrastructure. 
and uh, we are doing a lot of CDN enhancements. We are uh, working on uh, providing media APIs for encoding, transcoding, and ad insertion. Uh, we are releasing a neutral rendering platform uh, called OpenQ that's um, independent of any specific software like Zinc. And um, we are working on other um, AI services to go to general availability. Um, and something very interesting is about edge TPUs, that you will be able to download the model on a device offline, and the device will do the um, analysis and send the results to the cloud. So with that, I'm going to ask Jeff to come up the stage and take us to their interesting story, which is very inspirational. Um, I'm going to talk over the next 20 minutes or so about uh, live sports in, in the cloud. Um, we've been doing it for a long time on-premise, and uh, there's lots of opportunities in the cloud. So uh, my name is Jeff Webb. I'm Principal Streaming Architect. I'm from Sky UK, hence the accent. Um, so over the, what I'm going to talk about is about Sky. So if those are not familiar with who we are, I'll we'll go through that. Um, believe in better streaming, which kind of, kind of like uh, is part of our ethos. Um, success formula for live, like delivering a live streaming service. So what does that make? Software-defined streaming, this is our concept for the next generation platform. Um, how cloud benefits and uh, comparison of on-premise. So, um, we have a thing called single channel fault domain, which is really the kind of where the key innovation comes in. And uh, I'm going to show you what happens when something goes wrong. So about Sky, um, we have 23.6 million customers in Europe, and we operate in seven European countries. Uh, we're very proud now to be part of the Comcast family. Um, so that acquisition went through a few months ago. Um, SkyQ, which is our set-top box proposition in, in Europe, um, that's in 5.5 million homes. That's up from 3.4 million last, uh, last year. Um, we're increasing investment in original drama, a 25% increase over last year. Um, and very interestingly, uh, if you produce really good drama, then more customers will watch it. So you can see viewing has, has more than doubled in the last three, few years. Um, put this up here because this is something else as well. Um, I'm really proud to be part of a socially responsible company. So we have things like Sky Ocean Rescue, um, and you, you might have seen things across the internet, things about um, you know trying to save the oceans. There's a lot of plastic, you know, that uh, that we throw away and ends up in the animals and the whales and things, and it's not a good thing. Um, so believe in better streaming. Okay, I'm going to take you a little through a little journey over the last 10 years. Um, I myself have been at Sky for 14 years. Um, I've been in the streaming team since 2009. Um, so over that 10-year period, we've gone through three different generations. We started off as most broadcasters did in 2009, um, when Apple announced the, the HLS spec, and we wanted to be able to do live sports, you know, Premier League and things. Um, and so we did what most broadcasters did. They went, to, went out to market, went, to, uh, did a comparison, to go through the RFI, RFP process, bought some black boxes, plugged them in the data center, you had video in on one side, you had video out on the other side, and customers were happy. Fast forward several years, business changes, customers want higher quality, so you've gone from like standard definition phones, now you've got retina displays on your, on your phones and your tablo tablets, and so customers are expecting to get a better quality. Obviously, you've also got big screens, smart TVs, and so on. So we went to generation two, the problem with the first model is, is that you go and, and you try and buy the biggest box you can afford because you want to put uh, maximize your channel density. So you put like five channels on this big box, and this, book, this box costs you like $20,000. If you want to get more, then you spend more. That business model is fine up until you have to go and replace it. So every few years, you, you know, every, about every three years or so, you have to go through the upgrade refresh cycle, and that's a very expensive way of doing it. In reality, as a broadcaster, all you need is the software. Okay, the software is the intellectual property. So that's what, you, that's what we did in generation two. We said, okay, why would I buy your server? Okay, I, I just want to run your software. We can run our own server, as most enterprises do. We run VMware. Um, so that's what we did. We virtualized it, and we've run that platform for six years now, and that's been very successful. What I'm talking today about is moving to the cloud, uh, specifically for sports, because there's a really great opportunity for that. Okay, so just to give you some context, what is the success formula for delivering a live um, streaming service? This can be sports, it can be anything. Well, for, for, firstly, it starts with content. We, le leaving aside the technology, customers are, are in the pay TV operator, they want to be entertained. They want to watch the sports, they want to watch the Game of Thrones next week, um, they want to watch Italian or German football and so on. That is what they pay for, that's part of the experience, and so we shouldn't forget that. Um, 
at Sky, I'm part of what's called software engineering. Uh, software engineering is uh, it's actually quite a lot of people. I mean, in the building I'm in, there's like 800 or so that are in software engineering. Uh, and these guys and girls are very clever, and they basically go and write the software. Now, unlike a lot of, uh, a lot of other uh, people, we give the software away for free. So um, the network is obviously key to this. So if you own and operate your, your own network, um, then obviously you can ensure that that last mile connection especially um, is obviously optimized. In the UK, we offer Sky Broadband, which is a, our second largest ISP, uh, broadband provider in the, in the UK. Um, this is, now, I think, it's about 6 million customers. Um, Sky Broadband is also rolling out in Sky Italy later this year. Obviously, have lots of CDNs because you know, we have lots of traffic and lots of customers, um, which segues so, so nicely onto customers. So here's, a, here's what a Sky Q box looks like. Um, we have now TVs that uses Roku, and obviously mobile devices, smart TVs, consoles, and so on. Ultimately, if you take content plus developers, plus network, plus uh, this cost customers, <laughs> it all gives you quality. Okay, because lots of customers, they all want to do the thing, uh, watch the content at the same time. So next Monday is a good example. You'll have Game of Thrones on there at 9 p.m. It's going to be simulcast between the U between, uh, US and Europe. Um, customers want to watch it on their devices. They all want to watch it together because it's a social experience, just like when you get you know, Super Bowl or um, Olympics and things. Um, and they want to watch it in HD because that's what they, that's what they want. Okay, so software-defined streaming. This is a uh, reimagining of how we deliver and get. We kind of came up with this, this sort of interesting concept called streaming DevOps because we've been doing streaming for 10 years and we've been doing it very well um, and obviously customers are, are happy with that. But we wanted to make it better. And so we, you know, as being part of software engineering, we kind of looked out and, and asked our colleagues and said, okay, how can we take what other teams within Sky are doing uh, from the DevOps world and bring that into streaming. So we created something, we made it up, it's called Streaming DevOps. Um, and really it's four things that come into it. First is around resilience. So as a broadcaster, you're giving the customer the experience. In live sports, you can't afford to have downtime because if they've missed the goal, it's not gonna come again. They're gonna have to watch it on the, rep on the repeat or something. So you wanna try and avoid that at all cost. We came up with a single channel fault domain concept is I'll show you what that is in a couple of slides. And also I'll talk, I'll give you an example of how it's self-healing. So basically, if you have a problem, don't show the customer. Hide the problem until you've resolved it, okay? Some channels must stay on and that's critical. Geographic resilience is very key because, um, you know, a simple analogy would be, if you've got one data center, don't put all your channels in one data center because chances are one day something will go wrong and you'll lose not just one channel but a whole bunch of channels. So have two baskets. Do exactly the same. Make sure that the baskets are identical with your channels, and you'll be a lot better. Um, in order to do that, you need highly available synchronized video streaming, and that's what we'll sh we'll show a little bit later. The second pillar is around speed to market. Okay, Malika touched on it earlier. Problem with enterprises is that you have to go through the procurement cycle. Uh, if we order a server today, six to eight weeks later, the server will arrive. It'll get plugged in. It's too long. Yeah. You, how many football matches? How many you know, basketball games have you missed it by then? Well, quite a lot, especially if it's March Madness. Um, automated pipeline, so taking some of the benefits of what's going on in DevOps, so the continuous integration, continuous deployment. I'm sure obviously a lot of you, have, um, you know, Googlers and other people don't need to explain what that is. Um, third pillar is observability, okay? We're, we're dealing with video, we're a TV company, so when that Game of Thrones episode is coming through, you want to make sure that before it gets to the customer that it's actually good video and good audio coming out. Because if it had a lip sync issue, it's a bad customer experience. Okay, so you want to make sure that your monitoring systems before you actually get it to the customer is actually good. And doing that in an automated way is, is, a, is uh, the way to go. You obviously, for operations reasons, you want to be able to have centralized logging and monitoring you using open source tools like the Elk stack um, and also real-time dashboards, things like using Grafana and Prometheus as well. So you can give ops guys uh, actually what's going on right now with customers you know, and see how the platform is performing. And the fourth one really is actually the key one and the reason why I'm here today is talking about transportability. We, at the outset we had a, a desire, a principle to make the platform agnostic. So on-premise we run in VMware, um, so now we're taking it into Google with GCP. Okay. Just to mention there about GKE, we're not doing GKE on premise, but I just heard an announcement yesterday that it's coming, so. 
Okay, so how does the cloud benefit live sports streaming? Okay, fairly obvious one. It shortens the development cycle because you're not having to wait for infrastructure. We can spin up now channels in minutes. Okay, so everything's pre-configured. So if you take a, a Formula One example, uh, those Grand Prix are on, t on average about every two weeks, sometimes every other week, depending on the geography, but sometimes it's a bit longer. But they have the, on Friday, they have the practice, Saturday you have qualifying, on Sunday you have the race. Each of those channels must be consistently built. So if I have the Australian Grand Prix, and then I, two weeks later I have the Singapore Grand Prix, and then a week later I have the Bahrain Grand Prix, then the actual channel is configuration itself is the same. The only thing that's really changed over those three events is the, the time and actually the content itself. The way that I deliver it to a client is it's still the same endpoint. So when the customer presses play, it's still the same. Each channel in the, in the configuration must be built consistently. Um, we have a YAML file, um, yet another markup language. It has all the configuration parameters for channels. So you'd have things like your ABR ladder, you'd have DRM types, you'd have uh, stream formats and so on. Uh, this is really critical because this allows you to main maintain or become stateless. So your channel configuration can be stateless. This is, for, this is very uh, necessary for reasons I'll come to in a moment. We wanted the platform to be modular. So what is the technology changes from time to time? You know, some smart people uh, will go and invent uh, new codecs and things, um, you know, for new devices and stuff. Um, you know, things will come along and things will go away. Uh, so you need it to be modular so that you're not sort of locked into a particular technology when something much better can come along um, and possibly even be uh, cheaper as well. Um, cost effective, uh, so obviously, you know, make it make sure that you can do it cost effectively. Um, speed to market, fairly obvious. End-to-end uh, -end automation pipeline, you know, do everything automatically. Do not have engineers going into graphical user interfaces, manually putting in configurations and pressing, pressing apply. You know, that we used to do that, not doing that anymore. Um, so increased reliability and protection, a single channel folder, I'll show you that. And a really interesting thing that we uh, will now able to do in the cloud, because it's much more cost effective, is around AB multivariant testing. So imagine being able to have a Sky Sports channel, let's say it's Formula One, so that's on the next slide. Um, and then you have, that's a standard version. Then what we have is a sort of a, a B version of it, which is slightly different. So you make the B version available to some customers, you try what it is in the real world, um, and you get, you get feedback on it, you know, like you would do going through a trials process. This is video, so you actually, you actually need to see it, you know, you need the data, you know, so it's quite key. This new platform allows us to maintain channel uptime. So that's really critical. S software upgrades is you know, a classic problem. Okay, so in this diagram, I've taken a layered approach. So, so my arm's not that big. Uh, so at the top, you've got Sky Clients. Uh, you've got Sky Go, Now TV, Sky Sports, Sky Q. Okay, uh, on the next layer, we've got content delivery networks. Oh, obviously, there's many of them. We've got uh, video workflow with Harmonic. Uh, we've got core services layer. So this is uh, a sort of wrapper, and we'll see that on the next slide. We're using Jenkins, the sort of catch-up bottle is uh, what we call source. Source is our configuration management tool uh, that we've written in-house. We're using Prometheus, we've got Grafana, we've got Puppet for orchestration, we've got Elk Stack for logging and uh, information. Um, we've got uh, container and orchestration with Docker Engine and Kubernetes. We do run our own Kubernetes cluster, we're not using GKE at the moment. Um, and really what I would call out is the only difference is the bottom, bit, bottom layer. So you've got on-premise infrastructure, your typical Intel, Xeon, you know, uh, processors, et cetera, that cost you a lot of money and, you know, generally go out of date pretty quickly because, you know, the upgrade cycle on servers is pretty fast, 12 to 18 months. Um, and then on, on the bottom layer on the right-hand side, you've got a bunch of cloud stuff, hence we being here. So we'll go through, we've got Google Compute Engine, which we're using. We've got Google Cloud Storage, Google Load Balancing, Cloud Router, because we're dealing with video. We need to reliably get the video to the cloud not trusting the internet. Could use the internet, you know, that's possible, but you want to you want to take a sort of more reliable approach to it. So using like Google Direct Connect, having redundant 10 gig links, delivering multiple channels into the cloud is the sensible way to go. Um, you need firewalls there because you need to protect your data. Um, and you've got NAT and identity access management. So to name but a few. And really that's the only difference there. It's that bottom of the infrastructure. So what does single channel fault domain look like? 
Okay, so I've got an example here with Formula uh, Formula One channel. So and it, it's, a, it's quite uh, it's, and appreciate it's a little bit busy diagram. So working through from the top, we have Sky Sport. Uh, we have in the blue box at the, at the top there. We've got SDS top layer. It manages live channel configuration. Um, that's the YAML files and stuff that I was talking about before. You know, your five meg, your four meg, your three meg, your two meg, your one meg, your half meg. You know, in your AVR ladder for customers, your protocols, your HLS, your smooth, your dash, DRM types and stuff because you're a pay TV operator. And uh, it also manages capacity as well. So you were running, uh, we were on our own Kubernetes cluster. And so we manage the capacity on it to make sure that we have enough resources to be able to deliver the video at the right time in the right place. Uh, it also manages the, the metrics as well, so it's pulling all that in. And what it's doing, it's aggregating the metrics from the whole stack. So this is everything basically coming in from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. It's also, also pulling in the client-side metrics as well. So you actually get an end-to-end -end view, which is really, really cool for operations people because generally they often complain they don't have enough information or they don't have the right information. So trying to fix that and give them that visibility is really key. Um, the purple box on the left-hand side, um, it says STS video and quality monitoring. So its purpose is to moni monitor the output of the, me of the mezzanine. So this is your input into your transcoder. And that's comparing, you know, that 1080 source is coming, comparing against the output, which is what the customers are consuming. So they might be getting 1080 output, 720, 506, so on and so forth. So this is really key, and I mentioned it earlier, because you want to make sure that you're putting good video out. Yeah, that you're not dropping frames, that you're not having like lip sync issues, um, for example. Okay, so that's quite critical. Um, and then you've got the other green box there, which is harmonic content prep. Okay, what I would call out here is really, you see a, there's a gray box in the middle. It says availability zone one. And uh, yeah, uh, and then it's surrounded by sort of, it's a little bit hard to make out on this big screen here, but there's four boxes there. There's transcode, package and storage, there's encryption and origin server. What you'll notice is, there's a little sort of Google Cloud uh, in the middle there. You know, as we've seen in Malika's diagram before, Google Cloud is a lot bigger than that, but I couldn't fit it on the screen. Um, and then below, you've got availability zone two, okay? Really key is that we're doing this, this is highly available streaming. So in normal world, we're only just doing the top layer, you know, uh, and that's how, that's how we've been doing it for the last 10 years or so. The innovation really has come around being able to do it in parallel. So you've got two parallel streams coming in. So if you work through the example from the left-hand side, you have mezzanine, uh, mezzanine output going over the Google Direct Connect that I talked about. That's 10 gigabits redundant coming from two different data centers coming into a transcoder. At the transcoder, you've got this, you see the blue and the red arrows. You're coming in and there's a black arrow in between the transcoders. This is synchronization. I show it in the yellow box below where it says frame accurate synchronization. And frame accurate is actually key because if you want to put advertising on here, you need to make sure that it's frame accurate. Package and storage in formats, your HLS, your smoothie dash, okay? You need it to also be synchronized there, so you need to have a protocol that basically says, okay, you know, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I, you know, make sure that it's the same. Because otherwise, on the right-hand side, where it says active, active, live, synchronized content, and then with a little sort of globe there, you can't do something funky like go, AZ1, AZ2, AZ1, AZ2, yeah? Because you notice those two red arrows allows us to load balance live content in, uh, concurrently. Okay, and actually, I think more is gonna give you a little demo of that later. Um, so here, we're actually seeing that we can use both legs in parallel. These are in two different availability zones, so what I should say there is that they're in the same region. So if we deploy this, let's use the US example. We're West Coast now. So we went to Google's region in US West Coast, and we deployed this here. We put it into one AZ and a second AZ. So this means that if the AZ had an issue, then there is another one available to provide customers. So you've got redundancy at both the sort of data center level within the availability zones, but also a channel level, because going back to my earlier example, channel density was all around how many channels can I fit into this server here. So if I buy the most expensive server, you know, usual economics works out that I can get more channels on it. Problem is, is that the fault domain of that channel is the number of channels you can get. So if you can get five channels on it, and that box goes, gets broken, then five channels are affected. You have now an outage. Go back to my example about software upgrades. Software upgrades come out every few months. They might fix bugs, they might introduce features, but when it happens, 
you're going to take out five channels. Yeah? And this then this happens quite a lot. Um, so try and we we'll try and avoid that. Okay, so on my next slide, just talking about I've just talked previously about happy path when everything's working great. So what happens when something goes wrong? Because you know, we can't assume that everything's great. Um, I've got something that's gone red here. This is in availability zone one. My packager has gone wrong. I don't, I don't really know, for just purposes of this example, why that's happened, right? Don't really care, actually. What I care about is the customer experience. So the customers on the, excuse me, on the right-hand side must carry on working. They must keep on serving the CDNs. They must keep filling up the customer client's buffer on the, on the, on the playback. Um, and it must be consistent. So don't interrupt that customer experience. So the way that you go about this in this example is you need to do two things happen. Firstly is that you need to detect those a fault. Okay, so in the bottom box here, the packager in AZ1 has failed. Uh, and so this means a loss of resilience, not a loss of channel. Okay, and that's big distinction because you're still on air, you're still making money and you're not going getting customer tickets. Customer's not going to call, you know, call the, ring the call center to say, hey, I've just noticed you had a loss of resili resilience because they can still watch Game of Thrones or the football or something. Um, so the second thing you need to do on the right-hand side is you see there's a red X there where there previously was an arrow. You need to be able to make sure that you stop sending traffic to the broken leg. So in here, in my example, in availability zone one, um, that leg is gone. It basically, it's, 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 not, uh, it's not, not updating. So the manifest is not updating. There's no fresh video because the packager is no longer outputting video. So therefore, it can't be encrypted. Therefore, it can't be delivered by origin server. And go back to my, uh, my example, AZ1, bad, AZ2, good. That's, that model doesn't work. You know, that's a bad customer experience. What you need to do is make sure that you're only going to AZ2. So it's AZ2, 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 AZ2 because the other leg is fine, it's operationally good. Okay, now, the way that the, we've solved this problem is we, Kubernetes will do, uh, obviously, the monitoring, it will detect and rebuild that the packager in AZ1 has failed. I'll go and refer you back to what I was talking about a few minutes ago with uh, the YAML files. The YAML files are the state of the, the, state of the file, uh, of the channel. So, in this Sky Sports 1 example, we can return it back to how it was 30 minutes ago before the fault occurred. So we don't know why it's happened. What we were trying to do is restore that service as quickly as we can and put it back to how it was 30 minutes ago. Once we've done that, um, and the health checks pass, and the channel resilience is restored, okay, we actually go back to the previous slide, where it's now an AZ1. It's actually working again. And that's, re that's obviously really cool. I'll just call out the, the bottom things on the encryption as a pay TV operator. We have digital rights management, so the, the things like PlayReady, uh, Widevine, other DRMs, etc. And Origin, obviously, is storing out and encrypted. Um, the tools that we use to do this, uh, to actually restore, recover service, obviously, we operate around Kubernetes cluster. In the two AZs, we have independent clusters. Uh, so the one in AZ1 is independent of AZ2. So we run them in parallel, and we're doing the same workload in parallel twice. Um, we're using source. Source is something that we wrote ourselves, which is our configuration management tool. And it basically goes and manages that. So um, we use, and obviously, things like uh, Git and repos. And when an engineer wants to make changes, for example, they have to check in, they have to check out. We've got version control on it as well. So, and I don't have a slide on it, but we actually go through, just from a confidence point of view, uh, we actually go through five different, uh, uh, five different realms on our path to production. We go through a development cycle. So we have a development environment, we go through a test environment, we go through a non-functional test environment where we're injecting load, and uh, we go through a stage, which is uh, all about soak testing and making sure that it's reliable, um, because it's very important in video. You know, it's no good if it stays up for 24 hours and falls over, you need it to run for two weeks. Um, and then obviously in production, which obviously is what you're doing. Um, the one of the things that I will t uh, just sort of finish on is when we talked to Sky Sports about this, and we went through the sort of economics of the cloud. Uh, one of the things that uh, was called out was uh, we did the number crunching on it. And they had a system that they've had for operational for eight years. And uh, when we went through and said, look, 
that hardware is no longer supported, we can't get spare parts, we can't get software upgrades for it, um, we need to go and replace that. So we came out and it was a big number. It was a high six-figured number. Um, when we went through them and said, look, how often do you actually use that system? Because you know, the Formula One's only on you know, once every other week. The football's on several times a week. What do you do at this time of day when there's no football on, when there's no Formula One? Well, it's just sat there. Okay, well, maybe that's not the cost-effective way to do it. So we asked them, how many hours of programming do you have? It turned out to be about 1,000 hours of programming per year for, for various events. And we said, okay, well, surely there's got to be a more cost-effective way of doing it. Could we consider like an OPEX type thing and move those workloads to the cloud? And so we did that, and it's significant savings. I mean, it's more than, it's less than half the cost. Um, and it's always more flexible. And we don't have all those kind of pain points that we talked about before. We don't have to worry about infrastructure. You know, that's Google's problem. Um, we don't have to worry about uh, you know, storage, for example. That's Google's problem. Load balancing is Google's problem. You know, part of the, uh, uh, there we go. Okay. Thank you. I'm over time. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. You get to enjoy another accent. Um, I'm originally from Ireland, uh, and I'm going to try and speak very slowly because I've got a tendency when I'm nervous in front of big crowds to speak awfully quickly. Thank you very much. Um, so, I'm from Harmonic, um, and we believe in smarter, faster, simpler video streaming. And we were very excited to be involved with Sky and Google on this project. Just a little bit of background on who Harmonic are. Some of you may never have heard of us although I'm sure that over the years you've watched video that's flowed through many of our devices. We've been around for over 20 years. We are um, headquartered in, in Silicon Valley. If you happen to drive along the 237, we're about North First Street. Around the world, we have over 5,000 customers in the media uh, and service provider sector. Um, we started off building appliances um, and if we look at the number of uh, over the top channels we have deployed, uh, we entered the streaming market about when Jeff did many years ago. We have 38,000 live channels deployed today. Most of those channels, channels are deployed on appliances, but many of them are now deployed in our software as a service offering. In fact, if I look at our software as a service offering, for our customers, we actually deliver video uh, from our origin servers to over 6.5 million subscribers who pay those, those customers of ours every month for the video services that, that they watch. Subscription video is really difficult. As Jeff has described, you have to be, provide a really high quality of service. And our goal these days is really to make sure that we maximize that quality of experience for our customers' customers. So how did we do that? How did we make the transition from what was effectively a box manufacturer in Silicon Valley to someone who provides a software as a service offering. It was no small change. Um, but as the product architect, it was my job six years ago to kick off a project that looked at everything Harmonic did for its customers from end to end, and to think about how we could re-envisage that from a hardware uh, delivery to a software delivery. For customers, we take care of many things. We take care of ingesting content. Uh, we take care of playout, graphics, transcoding, over the top, even into the uh, traditional cable world and satellite world. We provide statistical multiplexing solutions. We encrypt the content. We package it. We provide origin serving functionality, manifest manipulation, and monitoring. And there was a very traditional way of delivering that in the appliance world. Very simple in terms of boxes, delivering functionality. Everybody understood exactly how it was deployed. Um, what we needed to do was we needed to think about it, reinvent it, reinvent it and deliver something that has a different architecture. It's based on containers. And think about all of those problems that Jeff described. How do you effectively provide one-for-one -one resilience? How do you provide upgrade availability? And we did that in a product that we did, we describe, uh, we call VOS, uh, which is our cloud native media processing platform and is what, uh, what Jeff used. And we also deliver that as a SaaS offering, VOS 360, to our customers. 
you know, when I look at Sky, Sky gave me all of the usual requirements that anyone starts off with a live project. They really wanted to hit all of the devices. They needed to use all of the streaming formats to make sure they got into those devices. Closed captioning, they need timed metadata because they were doing sports. You want to be able to know that a goal's gone off, send notifications. And they really wanted ease of installation, ease of monitoring, and ease of, ease of recovery. This is, what, this is what I hear from every customer. But what was different about Sky's requirements was that desire to make it better, that no single point of failure. And although Jeff didn't mention it, he also put, put a second constraint on it which was he didn't want any additional delay to his sports. Because, you know what, we could have built a very, really, very, very redundant system, but if we had delayed another 30 seconds, but he said, no, don't want any more delay to my sports. They need to be faster, not slower. So that, that made it a little bit harder. Um, I think we've been 45 minutes into this presentation, and it's time you saw some video. But before I do, I'm just going to show you one diagram. This is the diagram of the, of the video that I'm gonna show you, how we put it together. We deployed it on Google Cloud. We went a little bit further than Jeff asked for. We put it in separate, uh, in separate zones, not just separate availability zones. Um, and we used GKE, not GCP, because you know what? I like it when Google deploys Kubernetes for me. Like Jeff said, I don't want to worry about that either. <laughs> um, we built this, this system. Let's, what, let's see what that A-B um, switching looks like from a customer standpoint. Okay, so here's some beautiful content. And while you watch the beautiful content, it does say it's in 4K and HDR. And although I'm standing in a, in a theater today, I'm really sorry to tell you what you're watching isn't in 4K and, and HDR. I wish that it was. Um, however, if at home you would love to see it and you happen to have a Roku streaming device, there is a NASA channel in, on the Roku streaming device that we provide the back end for that will allow you to see this same content in 4K and HDR. And breathtaking as the content is here, it's even more breathtaking there. While you've been watching the video, perhaps you've noticed the uh, BOS 360 logo bopping back and forth from the left and right to the screen. That wasn't put there by a professional, that was put there by me, uh, which is why it's so accurately positioned. So what I did actually was I went into, my, I went into those two transcoding uh, instances that Jeff showed you previously, and I configured one of them um, to put the logo on the left side, and the other one to put the logo on the right side. A little bit of a difference. Um, and so that's why you get to see it bopping back and forward from either side. But it is beautiful content, and I do encourage you to go and have a look at it. I'm a, uh, a great uh, believer in, in NASA. I love it, and I love the content they produce. Some of the, the moon rises are amazing to watch. We did go even further than just zone one and zone two. We offer our software not just as a SaaS. I told you we sold it to customers on premise. So here is another diagram where you could actually do that same synchronization with an on premise cluster and a uh, cluster in GCP or GKE. I think we actually did deliver on what Sky wanted. And the challenge that we really had to solve was this challenge called uh, the CAP theorem or Brewer's theorem for the computer scientists. Among you, we already know what it is. For those of us who don't understand, basically if we partition two things and we drop information between them, then we have to make a decision about whether or not we, we serve every request, and sometimes the requests are different, or we only serve requests from one side when we know there are problems. Um, we don't want the video to jump back and forward. It gotta look seamless like it did here. So we sacrifice an availability and the whole challenge was to make your availability numbers for that backup system as high as possible. That delivered Sky benefits. It gave them the improved false tolerance. It gave them the, the ability to do green blue upgrades. It gave them the ability to do A-B testing way more than we originally thought of, of when we started off looking at the fault tolerance of this project. You know, I, I think as Harmonic in this project, we really did deliver smarter, faster, simpler um, video streaming. And, you know, if we, it's working with customers like Sky and working with people like Google that enables us to deliver on some of the, the most fantastic projects in the world with some of the greatest content. Formula One, NASA, it's a great place to be. Malika, do you have a question for both of us? Or are we out of time? 
All right. Well, I don't get to answer a question. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Malika. Thank you, Jeff. It's been great to be here. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>